Hi, Andrew Wolf here. In this video, I'm going to talk about the physiology of peristalsis. And I want to first start by talking about the smooth muscle cells. And I know everybody in, in um, my class has gone through the cardiac um, module. So you understand the concept of a syncytium. And just like cardiac myocytes, these smooth muscle cells within the GI tract are a syncytium. And I should say actually each layer is a syncytium. So the layer, the longitudinal layer is one syncytium and the circular muscle layer is going to be another syncytium. Okay, now Remember what the syncytium means. It means that it is a group of cells that share a cytoplasm. So functionally, they can act as one cells, as one cell. And this is important when we talk about action potentials because if we have an action potential, it can spread from cell to cell without stopping because it, again, shares the cytoplasm. And electrolytes can move freely from cell to cell. So if there is, is a wave of ion exchange occurring, it passes easily from cell to cell. So now what's interesting with the uh, smooth muscle of the GI tract is we have these little cells mixed in with the smooth muscle cells called Cajal cells. So if we have, you know, if you see sort of layer and layer of cells here, we have these little Cajal cells that sort of mix within this layer. And these Cajal cells are the pacemaker cells of the smooth muscle of the gut. Now, they're pacemaker cells, but they're not quite the same as the pacemaker cells of, say, the sinoatrial node, because they do not initiate action potentials. What they do is I'll make a little chart here and say we've got negative 90 resting potential. And actually, the resting potential is usually a little bit higher in the gut than it is in other cells. And then, you know, we've got zero way up here. And we may have a threshold that initiates an action potential at minus 30. And what the Cajal cells do is they set up a slow wave pattern that moves between like negative 40 and the resting potential, which is probably around negative 60, negative 70, depending on on uh, on the polarization of the cells at that moment in time. So these Cajal cells, and you know the, the mechanism works very similar to the pacemaker cells of the SA node where you just have slow sodium leak. The sodium leaks in, and then you have potassium leak out, sodium leaks in, and potassium leaks out. Now what's interesting, the is these Cajal cells, and this is still theoretical, the function of these Cajal cells, but they do not uh, initiate action potentials, but they do have this, they set up this rhythmic pattern in which the cells are hyperpolarized. That means it's going to take more to bring a cell to action potential, and hypopolarized. So when they're down here on the bottom, they are going to have an inhib in inhibited, be inhibited from initiating action potentials. And here, they will be very excitable. Now, this slow wave pattern sets up an underlying rhythm so that when we have something that is exciting the cells, they will be more likely to, here, let me erase this hyperpolarized here. They will be more likely to have um, initiated action potentials here 
because it's easier to get up above threshold, whereas down here, the same stimulus will not generate an action potential. So here we'll have an action potential, but here we will not. And when we get down here, we will no longer have them again. So we will tend to have action potentials only at the peaks, right? So this sends a, sets up a baseline rhythm. And this is really important. And we know that people, there are some diseases that kill Cajal cells. And when you have um, no functional Cajal cells, you lose the ability to have functional peristalsis. And this is due to the loss of rhythm, of the baseline rhythm that is within our gut. Okay, so keep that in mind that there is this baseline rhythm, and then we're going to start talking about um, how the nervous system um, actually initiates the action potentials um, within this underlying rhythm that is set by the Cajal cells. Okay. So here we have a diagram of the nervous system of the gut. And in particular, we're talking about the myenteric plexus and the older ner name for this, in case you come across this in some of your books, is Auerbach's or Auerbach's plexus. Um, it means the same thing. It's just two terms for the same thing. I think the myenteric is the more, um, is, is the more common term these days. So this um, this is my drawing of the myenteric plexus. It's these interconnections between neurons um, just above the um, muscularis of the gut. Now, and uh, you know, I, there is a submucosal plexus as well down here, but I'm not really talking about that during this discussion. It does is not really significantly involved in peristalsis. Um, okay, so the myenteric plexus has afferent sensory nerves. And these sensory nerves um, deliver information to interneurons within this plexus. Okay, so we have sensations moving up towards this plexus. Now, what kind of sensations? It's very attuned to stretch, and there are so some chemoreceptors as well. So both chemical receptors and stretch receptors can stimulate this plexus. Now, I want to point out here that actually I didn't draw this, but we do have sensory nerves that leave this plexus and go up to the brain, and um, we can be aware of sensations in our gut when they are powerful enough to be transmitted from this plexus up into the brain. And in fact, sometimes we can just, sometimes we may just feel um, the sensation of stretch. And when it's severe, we, we may feel a sensation of pain. Okay, so that's the, the sensory nerves. Now, uh, what happens is with, if we have a strong stretch sensation or um, strongly um, stimulated chemoreceptors, this sends information up into these interneurons, and then these interneurons send down um, information via the efferent nerves to the smooth muscle cells, and these um, smooth muscle cells are going to be stimulated with an action potential. So you're going to get those spike waves, and So if the sensory nerves stimulate the interneurons strong enough to send a impulse down the efferent nerves as a, a reflexive impulse, then it's going to stimulate a spike wave. And if the spike wave is powerful enough or occurs at the right time of the slow undulating, um, of the slow undulating wave pattern, to reach action potential, then it's going to cause a true action potential to occur and cause the muscle to contract. Okay. Now, there's a few things that can stimulate contraction of the muscle. One is the this reflex. Okay. So let's see what stimulates.
All right, and I'm talking about spike waves here that may or may not stimulate a contraction depending on the place that it occurs on that slow undulating um, wave pattern underneath. So stimulation will occur from reflexive action. That means it does not involve the central nervous system at all. It is just a communication between the afferent nerves and the efferent nerves as coordinated by the interneurons. And these reflexive actions are again stimulated by stretch or chemoreceptors. Now the other thing that can stimulate an action potential is acetylcholine. And acetylcholine comes through the parasympathetic nerves So it releases acetylcholine. So essentially this is parasympathetic stimulation. OK. Now, those of you who work in clinical practice, um, are may or may not be aware that any any medication that is um, that is anticholinergic is going to tend to uh, cause constipation, and this is important to note if you've got a patient that you've admitted with an ileus or that has problems with constipation, you don't want to give them anticholinergic, and that in includes major classes of antihistamines like Benadryl. Um, so. The parasympathetic nervous system stimulates peristalsis via the myenteric plexus. Now, the sympathetic nervous system actually inhibits peristalsis. However, it really only does this in extreme circumstances. So you have to be, you have to have very high levels of epinephrine or norepinephrine. Um, so this is a true sort of fight or flight emergency. And it's really sort of, it seems to be sort of an all or nothing phenomena. I, you know, weak stimulation of epinephrine and norepinephrine really don't, um, don't slow down peristalsis. However, um, severe stress is going to um, is going to stop it altogether. Um, so it sort of reminds me of the way that parasympathetic hasn't that kind of effect on the heart. It, um, it really sort of has a weak effect on the heart, um, but when, um, when it has an overwhelming response, it can drop heart rate significantly. And in this case, you know, the, the parasympathetic in the GI tract, the parasympathetic um, nervous system is really the one that's in charge and the sympathetic nervous system only really puts its input in when there is a true emergency. Now I have seen people, um, post-operative patients that are in severe pain that have enough of a stress response to that um, that it is probably contributing to what's called a postoperative ileus or paralytic ileus in which we have a situation where um, where a person has no gut function, no uh, peristalsis of the gut at all. Um, so severe pain can certainly cause a massive enough stress response or sympathetic um, nervous system response to stop peristalsis. Okay, so let's talk about peristalsis itself. Now what happens with peristalsis is we have a tube here and this tube is surrounded by muscles outside of the mucosa and submucosa. We have the longitudinal muscles and we have the circular muscles. Now and then we have a bolus of food here in the middle. And remember, the bolus of food is causing stretch. So what does the stretch do? Well, the stretch causes muscles here, the circular muscles, to contract.
right on top of the bolus. And at the same time, the longitudinal muscles contract as well. And so that shortens up the tube. But to complicate things a little bit more, these circular muscles just after the bolus actually relax. So you can see this takes quite a bit of coordination because we've got three things going down. We, we've got circular muscles right on top contracting. We've got longitudinal muscles right on top of it contracting. But the circular muscles just beyond are relaxing. And then you know, we're going to move down just a few centimeters more and we're going to start the process all over again with these circular muscles contracting and these longitudinal muscles contracting and circular muscles way up here relaxing. And then this pushes, the circular muscles push the longitudinal muscles shorten that part of the tube so you're pushing the bolus and you're shortening up the tube at the same time and these muscles relaxing allow this bolus to move in this direction and then this gets repeated over and over again and we slowly move it inch by inch interestingly enough this is the exact same kind of muscular reaction that allows worms to propel themselves so this brings us back to that theme that we are, in fact, a hollow worm. Yes, we're a very complex hollow worm, but we still have many things in common with our, you know, less sophisticated cousins. Okay, anyways, that's enough about peristalsis. Please do let me know if you have any questions in the comments below, and I will try to answer them. And also, as always, please take a moment to leave me feedback. Thank you very much.